So thank you all for coming, or actually being able to find the theater. It took us quite a while actually to find the place, so well done to all of you. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's nice for you to sit down a little bit as well. So enjoy yourself for the next 15, 20 minutes. Like, you know, IBC is hard. It's hard because there is IBC during the day and IBC during the night as well. So I can imagine how you guys feel. Uh, but um, without further ado, I just want to kind of start a little bit talking about the HDR in production. I'm here guest of a company Atomos, with whom I was working um, on developing some features that were necessary for productions that we were working on. Um, we had some ideas how we could make our workflow better, and we reached out to them, and, and they really helped make that happen. So I'm very, actually very happy to you know, show you uh, things that we were working on in the past year or so. I will focus definitely on the importance of uh, HDR monitoring on set, because um, you know, you probably, as you were walking around, you have seen that you know there is a you know this thing called HDR that everybody got uh, got excited about, and actually seems to be one of those technologies that we don't have to advertise a lot. We you know it's enough just to have a look at the image to understand that this is the way to do it. Now, what it really means to the end user, what it really means to us, you know, why is this HDR so good and why people really get excited about it? is um, basically uh, uh, just this slide is going to basically best explain you what happens. So on the left, I have an image which is in SDR, and the here I have an image in HDR. Now, certainly, because the lights are here very strong, you can't see the contrast very well. But one thing that, that is apparent the moment you look at an HDR image is that you have much more detail in the shadow. You see there is, and this is actually even more important to us sometimes than the highlight detail. We were so excited to find that we got this huge dynamic range that we were able to work with, and that we were able to open and display parts of the image that we were not really able to see in the past. And uh, apart from that, yes, we do have a great highlight, and the screens, the HDR screens are brighter. They're about 10 times brighter than the normal screens. So it is, it is just, you know, the image feels a little bit more like a real life or like lifelike. So it is very easy to convince the end user, the consumer, really like that this is the better looking image and this is the way how they need to enjoy it or how they would like to enjoy their shows. So straight away, the commitment from the biggest players on the market that are actually like driving this technology, and believe it or not, they are not television companies. The, the TV companies take a little bit time because of their infrastructure, how to implement a HDR, but What's happening is that uh, the streaming providers like Netflix and Amazon, uh, all they had to do is just change their codec, and already we were able to watch HDR at home. So the first question that we discuss when we talk to the production whether we should go HDR or not is the equipment and the infrastructure needed to support that production. So this is always the first question. Hey. We love the sound of HDR, but how much is it going to cost, or can we do it? This is the number one kind of question the producer will always going to ask me. So um, the great news about all of that is that actually all we have to do in order to enable production to be HDR is just to replace the monitors. This is all we have to do. So the cameras, lenses, recording devices, cables, um, equipment for color grading, equipment for editing, everything, everything stays the same. The only thing we change is the monitor. That's all. Which makes this actually technology very easy to adapt and very easy to work with, you know, because you know, it wasn't like a 4K when we said, oh my god, 4K is great, we have to do it. But of course, we had to go and take out all of the equipment, all of the cabling, everything out of our studio and bring completely new infrastructure in order to be able to work in 4K. Now, this is not the case with HDR. All we had to do is just replace the monitors and you know, figure out actually how best to do it. That is all. Um, here is a shot from a very first uh, HDR show that I did. Um, actually, uh, we won an award 
for this show for the uh, best picture in television by the American Cinematographer Society. And it was the very first HDR production for, for Netflix as well. And it was a pioneering project. When we were started doing that, there was absolutely no information about HDR apart from that research work that I did together with Dolby on that and, and, and that's some support that we were getting from their engineering department. So we really had to figure out from the beginning and the end how we're going to do this ourselves. Now, at the moment when we were doing the show, we didn't have any ability to display HDR images on set. There was only one monitor that we were able to get, which was, and still today, it's the only reference monitor. And the cost of that monitor and availability of that, that monitor just made it impossible for us to make it viable to use it on set and to be able to see how these images are really going to look like once they're finished. But you know, with a little bit you know, mathematics and calculations, we were able to guarantee to the production that what we are capturing is going to have the right dynamic range. This is a shot from the second job we did. Um, and uh, we shot it actually with the same DOP, uh, Vanya Chernyol. And this is a commercial for uh, Panasonic Viera. They have released um, HDR monitors, incredibly good home monitors that you basically buy to watch that Netflix show at home. So um, this was a shot uh, that we did in, um, in um, South Africa. And on what was very specific about this particular production is this. What I'm holding here is the prototype of the very first uh, Atomos HDR monitor that we have used. And this is Vanya, basically. And uh, what, what we were able to do is we were able to, for the first time, have the ability to see the images as we are shooting them in HDR on set on a battery power device. And this is exactly what I was doing throughout the shoot. I was able to constantly work on the image, adjust the image, uh, tweak it further as we were shooting. And um, results were just absolutely fantastic. I mean, to have that freedom to know what something is going to look like at the end and to have the ability to see the image in HDR on set made a huge, huge difference to us. And this is exactly you know, where, where Atomos has basically have come up and really like, given us you know, the, exactly the tools we needed to, in order to be able to do our jobs in the best possible way. Now, uh, what you have to understand uh, is a little bit of a technology behind it. So you have to understand why we are really, what actually goes into that. So it's not just the monitor itself that has to be able to display the high dynamic range. It's great if we have a monitor that can show it, but there is a little bit more we needed in order to make this workflow really liable. And what's happening is following. Digital cameras have to capture a very high dynamic range and compress it into smaller file sizes in order for us to be able to move it through existing pipelines. So all we have is existing 10-bit cables that we can plug from monitor to monitor and, and file sizes that we're trying to keep as small as possible in order to be able to manage the data. And the trick that we use for that is the logarithmic color encoding. So as you can see, this curve here, this is the standard Rec. 709 dynamic range curve. This is a, like a 2.4 gamma that Rec. 709 is using. And as you can see, it's able to capture only 100 nits of dynamic range. What cameras from Sony, from RED, or from, or, or from RE, or from Canon are doing, or Panasonic's V-Log, what they're doing is they have created a logarithmic curves. And these logarithmic curves actually help us compress the dynamic range that sensor is capable of capturing into a smaller manageable file sizes. However, these images look very unpleasing when we look at them on set, on monitor, and you don't really know what's happening because this is not, we're not meant to look at that image. That image is only compressed so we can transport it from one point to another, but on a display, it doesn't give us any information how things are going to look and how, how things are going to feel and what's going to happen at the end. So it's hard, it's hard for DOP to know, hey, am I exposing correctly? Am I doing things right? What's this going to look like at the end? Because you're looking at these very flat-looking images. So what's possible to do is actually possible to apply like a transformation curve and see, hey, 
this is what this image is going to look like. So this is the log image, and this is that image which now has this transformation curve applied to it. OK. So what uh, Atmos did then, they went a little bit a step further. And they gave us a very interesting tool in their software, which is basically the ability to control the amount of HDR that you're going to have and display in that particular scene. So you see this slider here, this slider here is our ability to, to kind of say, OK, so now we expose the shot. Now let's have a look what it's going to look like in SDR. So we move the slider completely to the left. Now we see, OK, this is the dynamic range that we would get on a normal shoot, on a normal kind of monitor. However, not every scene needs full dynamic range. You, know, not, you don't have always like, you know, sunsets like here. This is not always the case. So in that case, we need to reduce the amount of you know, HDR. We don't go to maximum like here here, where we can see the full 1,500 nits. You see that I can see all detail in the sun, where none here. I can see the sun. I can see the highlight reflections. There is no reflection detail. Here we have some. So, but sometimes I can also control it in the scenes and go put it midway. So we have the correct contrast. We see the image, what it looks like. But also, we can check, hey, what, is gonna, what it would be like on the full HDR or not. And it's a, just a, like a moving around with the finger on a touch screen on the monitor. And that is great, because I can give the DP the confidence, hey, this is the way how things are going to look like. Uh, this is the maximum. This is the whole of the dynamic range. Or this is what ideally the dynamic range we should have in this shot. So it makes us control. Now, this is also very interesting. This helps us really understand what this is. I love this kind of visualization of that data, of understanding what's happening. So you see this line here is just telling you what is the dynamic range that you are losing. So this is coming through. And this line says, OK, all of this is being lost, all of this being lost. And here you have everything inside. So basically, you can like see which part of your image are you getting, or do you need to go lower or higher, and how best to adjust your HDR on that particular shot. However, we have taken this a step further. You see, and, and it's something, it's also called the commercial reality of the you know, episodic television. For Marco Polo, we were giving something like four days to color grade each episode in both SDR and HDR. And the quality uh, expectation that we were getting from it was close to the you know, blockbuster feature release. You know, we were really going for the best possible image quality. And I'm pretty sure, guys, if you watch Netflix at home, you can see the quality that we are achieving today on this type of shows. The time we get given is about fifth or a quarter of what we get on a normal feature film. I would grade a feature film minimum two weeks. We have a now film in our production company, in our house in London, which is like basically already two months in color grading. It's a, it's a major Warner Brothers release, so they can certainly afford this time long grading. But I'm just telling you, it's just to compare the difference to what it means to create something in four days or two months. So the only way for us to be able to actually achieve such a great result in such a small time was to move color away from the grading suite, start doing it already on set. And I'm a big believer that color grading has to move out of the grading suite, has to be done much sooner. So instead of us just managing the HDR on set and seeing how things are going to look, we're going to go and we're going to apply our color lab, our color science, in the same device from Atmos, and which is already what we're doing, and we are able to see how images are going to look like actually, you know, when finished. So just to demonstrate what it really f means. So here is the log image, and here is what you would get when you were like going to the Rec 709, and here is that same log image with a creative look applied to it. Okay, so. We're not just managing dynamic range. We are managing the look, the feel, the final you know, like result that we have to get. And we get it on set straight away. So what happens afterwards is we can then take that metadata, that color metadata that we created on set, and we track it throughout the production process. So in the lab, we apply this color metadata so the, so the dailies look exactly like the finished product.
in the edit, the editor works with dailies that look exactly like the finished product. So when we come to grading, we conform not just picture and sound, but we also conform the color metadata so we can start grading with this look. This is the standard. We don't start with this, what we had. Like We don't start with a log. We start grading with this look. And that allows us to actually finish our job in four days to come and actually you know, spend our time we have in the grading suite for the most useful stuff, for fin finishing, for giving that you know, final touch, for that kind of finessing, which is really what is most important. This is already working now. And we have worked with Atomos to integrate our software, Color Lab, to basically move that color decisions that DP has made into the device to have a, like a basically a battery powered portable color managed monitor that is capable of creating also the metadata of what has happened on set to be able to preview with a, like a, just a touch screen. You can choose which looks you want to do. And so color manage preview in SDR and HDR and be able to work incredibly flexibly on set fast efficient. We have the control. And that is very important to feel that we're in control, that we, that's what's doing, that there is nothing left to fix it in the post. Hey, this is what we're getting. Do you think this is right or not? And when the DP start working in that way, they just completely move to the next level. They know that they have to make adjustment to the lighting or to anything else because they see what thing, well, how their shot is going to look like when finished. And this is basically that kind of the trick, you know, how we're achieving that extra quality. So I would like to thank to Atmos for the support as well, you know, and for listening to our needs and, you know, for implementing, you know, all these little, you know, tricks into their devices and making it happen uh, for us and actually making our life much easier. And I think also for pushing the boundaries to what is possible. Um, and